Welcome back and for the afternoon session. This is the, the last uh, panel session, then we'll, we'll be going to, to a salon. Um, this is something, something that's sort of intrigues. So, so this session is about aesthetics and the law, and um, it's not going to be about intellectual property. It's going to be about a range of things about aesthetics and the law. And we've got three great speakers. Um, Stefano Block, Presidential Diversity Fellow in Urban Studies from Brown University. Sergio Menez Sarmiento, founder of the Art and Law Program at Fordham University. And Brian Susek, who is a law professor at University of California, Davis. I'm going to hand straight over to um, Stefano Block um, for the first talk. Stefano. I just want to say thank you to um, Provost Pradeep Sharma, uh, Yuriko Saito, and uh, Patty. Where's Patty? And everyone at RISD for making this all possible and being so incredibly uh, hospitable. Even though I only had to come down from the hill at Brown, I feel welcomed into this new environment. My opening statements come in the form of a provocative challenge to resist the temptation to celebrate street art and altogether resist the use of the term art when referring to illegal aestheticization practices. Further, I defend graffiti against those who seek to defend it by calling for its acceptance or legalization in particular spaces. So I will start with three points that I will elaborate on further for the rest of my 12 minutes. Point one will be applying the word art to graffiti that is deemed acceptable creates a hierarchy that privileges those who produce more mainstream and politically legible aesthetics, thereby granting those individuals greater access to space, while others are further made invisible, marginal, and criminal. Point two, people judge street art and graffiti not based on a pure aesthetic sensibility, but based on the images, legality, and placement. Such judgment is subjective and culturally informed. Therefore, it is space and the law that informs our understanding of and appreciation for art, that is street art, graffiti art, more than it is an aesthetic purity or quality of the image. And point three, creating sanctioned space for the legal production of graffiti in the hope that graffiti artists will elevate their craft further denies those who produce aesthetically unacceptable and illegal forms of graffiti their right to the city. Perhaps counterintuitively, legally sanctioned graffiti zones and street art spaces limit and confine an otherwise anarchic and spatially untethered aestheticization practice. Put simply, art is far too loaded of a term to be applied to something so distinctly human, such as interacting with and aestheticizing space. A desire for art and aesthetics should not unwittingly help determine who and what is afforded access to the city. And it is actually the laws regarding vandalism that treat street art and graffiti as graffiti art more equitably by refusing to address appearances altogether. The use of the term art to describe cerebrally stimulating, politically savvy, and economically invigorating forms of graffiti has consequences for the transgressive and spatially conscious community that gave rise to it. Graffiti, that is the illegal, systematic, and stylized marking of surfaces with spray paint, markers, and other implements, which has long been dismissed as aimlessly cryptic at best and criminalized as violently territorial at worst, has become further demonized as more acceptable, elevated, and enlightened forms of legal street art and graffiti art make their appearance. In the past decade and a half, as graffiti writers continue to navigate public hostility, moral panics, and zero tolerance policies informed by the broken windows theory in part, street art in its various forms has become tacitly tolerated and even widely accepted in cities around the world. Berlin, Sao Paulo, Melbourne, and Cape Town, not to mention Los Angeles and New York City, among many other municipalities located on every continent, officially and tacitly tout the proliferation of street art as one of their selling points to would-be tourists and investors. As we speak, both Delhi and India and Bologna and Italy are hosting sanctioned street art shows, just as Detroit is slowly emerging as the US's street art capital. <laughs> 
Street art takes many forms, from ephemeral political satire stenciled onto telephone poles to large-scale murals painted on the side of privately owned or otherwise abandoned buildings. In a 2008 letter, letter to world-renowned street artist Shepard Ferry, a RISD alum, then presidential candidate Barack Obama thanked Ferry for supporting his candidacy with the visually striking and ubiquitous hope and change street art images, which depict Obama in three-quarter view in Ferry's trademark red, blue, black, and gray palette. In the letter, Obama even shows his appreciation for Ferry's illegal use of, quote, the backs of street stop signs and other surfaces where he placed stickers and wheat-pasted posters to help get the message about his candidacy out to the people. Illegal street art, even that produced by Ferry or by, by the world-renowned Banksy, whose stencils cut out of walls have been sold for over $100,000, in the eyes of the law is in fact classified as vandalism. Here in Rhode Island, graffiti is the legal classification for markings that are willfully, maliciously, or mischievously written upon, painted upon, placed upon, or used to deface public or private property, even if that graffiti is widely accepted and even highly valued. What distinguishes art from vandalism, then, is where it occurs, not what it is or what it, what it looks like or even what it is worth. This legal understanding is actually far more objective and fair than the hierarchy most of us create when we, we determine a marking's worth and right to be seen in the public sphere based on the subjective reading and appreciation of its aesthetic merit. Graffiti as vandalism is often erroneously referred to as scribbling or gang writing. While some graffiti, a very small per percentage nowadays, is in fact gang related and produced for the sake of territorial demarcation, I have never in my two decades of analyzing graffiti as a practitioner and later and now as an academic encountered scribbling on a surface in any city I've been to. And when I have encountered scribbling, that scribbling was an intentional and playful commentary on people's supposition that graffiti is merely scribbling and therefore can be seen as satirical street art. But judgment regarding the aesthetic quality of a marking on a wall is, in theory, not dependent on the marking's legality. While context and placement may very well affect one's perception or appreciation of a marking's aesthetic quality, the aesthetic merit of the marking should have no relationship to its legal status. Aesthetic appreciation and taste, according to Kant and not to Bordeaux, is again, in theory, purer than that. In order to encourage more aesthetically pleasing graffiti over ugly tagging, citizens and local governments have sought to provide sanctioned spaces for the legal production of what they're calling graffiti art. In such spaces, graffiti writers could freely elevate their art and produce something more aesthetically sophisticated and widely accepted. These spaces would purportedly also help reduce the presence of generally unwanted graffiti in surrounding neighborhoods. Such safe zones would enhance graffiti's appeal, turning graffiti into art and thereby ensuring that its aesthetic remain an indelible aspect of the city. In many cases, providing these legal spaces would work to appease communities who feel threatened and offended by what they perceive to be ugly graffiti. My problem with such sanctioned spaces is that providing locations for the legal painting of graffiti creates an uninformed hierarchy in which good graffiti is placed above bad graffiti, thereby limiting those who produce unacceptable aesthetics their right to the city. Here, aesthetics become a litmus test for spatial existence. I fear that our desire to see appealing graffiti art especially in hip urban neighborhoods, may unwittingly contribute to some people's invisibility, criminalization, and displacement as a result. And at this very moment, it, um, there is an artist in Italy, I just had the, the article translate, translated in the, in the past few hours, but there's a street artist, um, a very famous street artist named Blue who operates in Bologna, and he's currently whitewashing his murals in protest of not just the commodification of street art, but protesting street art's unequal treatment by landowners, law enforcement, and city boosters who otherwise romanticize his aesthetically pleasing productions. His protest is against those who are enervating his work by loving it to death. Thank you.
Thank you, Stefano. Um, we're going to move straight on to uh, Sergio Menos Samiento. Hello? Yeah, perfect. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, coming out on this beautiful day to hear this uh, three presentations on art and law to some extent. Um, a quick thank you to Prandeep and to uh, Eureka for inviting me to this conference. To be artistic does not necessarily mean to be lawful. Conversely, we continue to witness artistic projects that are well within the boundaries of law, yet lack any substantive rigor. Projects with little to no critical links to artistic practices and histories, to a social purpose, or to legal economic interrogations. In order for artists to question art and aesthetics through law, there must be artistic intent. For to act in complete disregard of the law is to believe in dissent, in an outside of the law. It is to believe that true dissent needs no First Amendment protection. The belief in so-called outlaw and unlawful practices is perfectly in line with being an artist, at least in a historical sense, and I fully endorse these beliefs and practices. However, in order to believe and engage in these types of outlaw practices, artists must be ready and willing to endure the accompanying legal and social consequences. You might ask, what can the law possibly have to do with aesthetics? Let me propose that any contemporary analysis of art making, of the art object, of the valuation and evaluation of art, and of the dissemination of art through the mechanisms of law is fundamental to understanding culture's relation to the social, political, economic, and the juridical. If we seek to analyze the dialogue between art and law, it is essential that we pay focused attention to the types of questions we ask and how we approach an analysis to these questions. In order to foster a new and rigorous understanding of contemporary artistic production, artists and scholars must ask questions through legal and juridical frameworks. In order to fully understand the apparent disjunction between art and law, and in order to create a new perspective and space from which to create culture, we must approach and assess cultural production by asking questions that are formulated and solved through and with an understanding of legal structures and mechanisms. The law's impact on contemporary art is not far-fetched and should not be seen as radical or controversial. In fact, art historian Benjamin Buchlow foreshadowed my argument when he highlighted Marcel Duchamp's seminal 20th century artistic gesture and its relationship to law. I quote Buclo. Beginning with the ready-made, the work of art had become the ultimate subject of a legal definition and the result of institutional validation. In the absence of any specifically visual qualities and due to the manifest lack of any artistic manual competence as a criterion of distinction, all the traditional criteria of aesthetic judgment, of taste, and connoisseurship have been programmatically voided. The result of this is that the definition of the aesthetic becomes on the one hand a matter of linguistic convention and on the other the function of both a legal contract and an institutional discourse, a discourse of power rather than taste. To illustrate his argument, Buclo cites Duchamp's hiring of a notary to certify that his 1919 subversion of a reproduction of Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa was the authentic and original ready-made. Buclo contends that Duchamp's ready-mades eviscerated the conce concepts of authenticity, authorship, and the belief in the autonomy and self-sufficiency of the art object. 
However, what I argue is that this seemingly innocuous linguistic inscription, the notarization on Duchamp's Mona Lisa, did not just do away with traditional studio aesthetics of handmade production. Rather, the, this linguistic legal maneuver also reinstated the belief in and market value of authenticity and authorship. The reemergence of authenticity and authorship would soon be upheld and legally sanctioned through conceptual art practices and eventually by certificates of authenticity. In effect, both conceptual art and certificates of authenticity made an art object a simple lieutenant. If, as Buchlo argues, it was conceptual art after the ready-made that established an aesthetic of administrative and legal organization, we can conclude that by the time conceptual art was well underway, the late 60s and early 70s, the definition of author and art shifted from the aesthetic to the legal. It was no longer the signature of the artist that authored and authenticated an art object, but rather the use of legal instruments such as the bill of sale, the contract, and certificates of authenticity such as Saul Lewitz and Piero Manzoni's. And thus the definition of art shifts from the artist's studio to the legislative chamber. And here, as you can see, art as defined by the US Copyright Act. Obviously, we're not going to read it all. But you can see on A1, section A1, a, painting, a, a work of visual art is a painting, a drawing, a print, or sculpture. And if you have time to look at uh, Title 17 of the Copyright Act, I would, I would uh, encourage you to do so to see how, the, how Congress defines a work of visual art. Our understanding of art shifts from art criticism and art history to legal briefs and judicial opinions, from art schools to law schools and Socratic analysis. In essence, if art is to be defined and understood by legal and administrative discourses and institutions, so must the definitions of author, authenticity, originality, copy, and appropriation. Ironically, artists are now faced with the daunting task of having to challenge and contest a legal order that artists of the 20th century helped put in place. However, not all artistic projects that challenge and appropriate law are successful. That being said, there are cultural gestures that successfully analyze the law's fiction and force without disregarding aesthetics. For example, Christophe Bouchel, when he expanded his legal battle against the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, into an art project that unveiled the performative, political, and linguistic machinations embedded in a lawsuit. Bouchel's project analyzed the quintessential training ground for democracy, the litigation process which depends on a notion of justice upheld by lies, nefarious legal procedures, political parties, linguistic obfuscation, and class distinctions. And yet there are some art projects that privilege aesthetics and the, and the commodification of art at the disservice of analyzing the relationship between artistic and legal fictions, thus perpetuating a superficial and pedestrian understanding of the law. These projects, art as art, do not help us to better understand the camouflaged and amorphous nomenclature otherwise known as law. A clear example of the symbolic approach is Carrie Young's Declare, Declared Void II project from 2013. According to Young's press release, this project consists of a large-scale text in black vinyl with a wall drawing which delineates a corner of the gallery. The text takes the form of a contract in which American citizenship is offered to the viewer in return for the viewer entering the performative platform created by the artwork. Take also Young's Declared Void project from 2005 where Young informs art viewers that they will waive their US constitutional rights by stepping into a cubic space delineated by a thick black vinyl line applied to the walls and floor. Alongside the wall, Young adds the following text. By entering the zone created by this drawing, and for the period you remain there, you declare and agree that the US Constitution will not apply to you. This quaint metaphor pales in comparison to the ongoing situation endured by numerous subjects at Guantanamo Bay Detention Camp. And yet Young was quite aware of the Guantanamo Bay Detention Camp. While crafting this project, Young sought legal advice on how best to recreate the gray area of the detainee prison at Guantanamo Bay.
Young's recreation is not a legal fiction. It is simply gratuitous fiction, make-believe, without force, without consequence, and without import. In Young's first project, Declared Boy II, viewers are asked to pretend that they have been granted the highly coveted US citizenship within an art gallery space by the waving of a magic wand and the drafting of a contract. In Declared Void, Young's viewers, in, in New York's Chelsea Gallery no less, are asked to imagine what it would be like to lose their constitutional rights, freedom of expression, the right to be secure against unreasonable surges and seizures, and the right to be protected against cruel and unus unusual punishment, presumably while scrolling through their seesaw gallery guide on their handheld gadgets. Clearly, the architectural legal differences between an art gallery and a prison are not obvious to all, as is the fact that prisoners at Guantanamo Bay are not voluntarily waiving any of their civil and human rights. In brief, no one within Young's gallery art project will actually experience the schizophrenic physical, emotional, psychological traumas experienced by RSTs and detainees in Guantanamo Bay. Young's viewers will not exist in a state of legal limbo, stateless, homeless, and lawless. Contrary to Young, there are art projects that successfully engage law. These other projects intend to ask probing questions rather than provide sophomoric moral claims. Take, for instance, Gordon Monte Clark's sculptural architectural project, Day's End, installed, or perhaps deinstalled, in New York City's Pier 52 in 1975. Much has been written about Monte Clark's trespass as a work of sculpture and performance art. But to my knowledge, little has been written on the relationship between Monte Clark's act and the history of property in the United States. To Monte Clark and to his attorney, the artistic reasons for breaking into city property to carry out an art project were paramount. Monte Clark's attorney advised Monte Clark on the importance of an artistic statement and artistic intent. Quote, the statement should generalize about what you did and avoid descriptions, but you should amplify the artistic intentions and relate it to your theories about art and this kind of art. Equally important was Monte, Clark, Monte Clark's conceptualization of his trespass as appropriation. I quote Monte Clark, I simply appropriated the pier by keeping my crew of henchmen boarding and barbed wiring up all the alternative entrances except for the front door in which I substituted my own lock and bolt, unquote. Furthermore, by cutting an elliptical shape into a side wall, Monte Clark's intent was to create an overriding property right by aestheticizing a debased and abandoned structure. Quote, it would seem within the rights of an artist, or any other person for that matter, to enter such premises with a desire to improve the property, to transform the structure in, into the midst of an ugly criminal state into a place of interest, fascination, and value. The use of land was also held to be of major import in, a, in Johnson v. McIntosh, a fundamental property law case in the United States from 1823, where the US Supreme Court granted Native American land to US settlers under the ruling that the settlers discovered Native American land, which was, according to the Supreme Court, untitled land. Like the settlers need to create a fictional legal construct, discovery, to override pre-existing Native American definitions of property, Monte Clark employs the same tools of the colonizer to question current property laws and property use. Property law scholars Eduardo Peñalver and Sonia Cachel argue that the violation of property laws by outlaws can enhance the social order. In their view, the apparent stability and order that property law provides owe much to the destabilizing role of the lawbreaker, who occasionally forces shifts of entitlements and laws. Monte Clark's intentional appropriation of private property, property questions what the better use is in an unauthorized taking of property. Power dynamics have never been more palpable. We are no longer simply witnessing the traditional power battles between corporations and corporations against individuals. We are also witnessing the birth of the creative individual against another creative individual. Because of this new, manifest, new manifestation, the logical outcome is one of power oppositions between artist and artist. Given the late 20th century rise in the appropriation of law by artists, it is only natural that artists of all classifications leverage law to empower themselves and their immediate constituencies. When it comes to appropriating law, 
Maybe it isn't as simple as resolving a clear dialectic between the author and a plagiarist, or of the original and the appropriated, but rather that we use law as a tool for exposing the systems that create and perpetuate the powers that shape aesthetics and our built environment. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. We're now going to move on to Brian Sousa. My topic is aesthetic judgment in law. And conveniently on that topic, almost everyone is agreed. Namely, they're agreed on the idea that law should not be engaging in aesthetic judgments. The conventional wisdom here is that of Justice Holmes, who wrote in a 1903 copyright case that it would be a dangerous undertaking for persons trained only to the law to constitute themselves final judges of the worth of pictorial illustrations. Justice Holmes' sentiment was echoed in 1987 by the late Justice Scalia, who scoffed that for the law courts to decide what is beauty is a novelty even by today's standards. This claim is wrong. Scalia's descriptive claim is absurd. The normative claim that Justice Holmes made is far too sweeping. That at least is what I want to argue in my short time here today. As I'll explain, the two reasons most often offered in support of Holmes's admonition against aesthetic judgment, they're both misguided. The one rationale that does have force supports a far more limited restriction on aesthetic judgment in law than most recognize. Put another way, Properly understood, there's more room than most think for contestation over what substantive aesthetic values and artistic choices we want the law to embody or promote. So what is this aesthetic judgment in law that I'm talking about? My understanding of the whole concept is a capacious one. By law, I mean to personify the whole range of legal actors who grapple with aesthetics. Not just the judges that Holmes and Scalia mentioned, but legislators and agency officials as well. These are the people who decide what aesthetic values or artistic concepts to endorse and inscribe in the law, where law here is used now in its more literal, uh, usually written down sense. As for what I mean by aesthetic judgment, any determination of what counts as art, uh, what constitutes aesthetic value, falls under the definition that I'm using here today. Thus I mean, but I don't only mean, judgments of the form X is beautiful, the kind of thing that Kant wrote about in the third critique, I also mean to include what Kant wrote in the, first, in the third critique, judgments about aesthetic judgment. For example, the Kantian claim that judgments of the form X is beautiful must be disinterested or must make a claim to subjective universality. So let me gallop through a range of substantive concrete examples. First, within tax law. I certainly would want to include the art advisory panel within the IRS a group that last year evaluated some 315 artworks looking out for charitable donations that were overvalued or inherited objects that had been undervalued. In 62% of the cases, they adjusted the, the uh, taxpayer's valuation of their works. Lest you think that the IRS cares only about market value and not aesthetic value, consider the controversy in 2012 over Robert Rauschenberg's Canyon. Because his combine incorporated a bald eagle, the selling of which is a felony under federal law, its fair market value was zero. The IRS disagreed with Christie's, however. Looking instead to the work's artistic worth, the IRS valued the piece at $65 million, <laughs> demanding a $29.2 million tax burden, tax bill. Now, of course, I count these things among the law's aesthetic judgments. But I also want to consider higher order judgments about art that are expressed in the tax code. For example, the decision in Section 501c3 to treat arts organizations as tax exempt, not as arts producers, but only insofar as they're deemed educational. Or the decision to disallow depreciation on works of art, at least those that are called valuable and treasured, as opposed to merely decorative. The judgment here, of course, is that art, unlike fashion, is not subject to obsolescence. 
Turning to land use law, I would certainly want to include as aesthetic judgment zoning regulations and sign ordinances that are justified purely in aesthetic terms. That's a mid-century innovation, by the way. Include historic preservation laws that protect exemplary architecture or an area's quaint and distinctive character or special historical or aesthetic interest or value. And of course, I would consider, I would include blight determinations where private property is condemned, in the Supreme Court's words, as an ugly sore which robs the community of charm, which makes it a place from which men turn. Within obscenity law, aesthetic judgment arises from the constitutional requirement that obscene works must lack literary, serious literary or artistic value. This leads to aesthetic judgment not just at the retail level, the case-by-case -case determination of serious value, but also on the wholesale level. For example, the Supreme Court's judgment that a work's artistic value, unlike its prurience or its offensiveness, is an objective fact that doesn't vary from community to community. Of course, I also want to include the thing we're not talking about, the myriad aesthetic judgments made within intellectual property law. Uh, we've just seen the Copyright Act put on the screen. Copyright infringement actions often turn on whether an ordinary observer would find two works substantially similar, which is sometimes to say whether their aesthetic appeal is the same. Aesthetic judgment comes up in the fair use defense, in the useful article doctrine, which denies copyright to objects uh, unless they have an aesthetic element that's physically or conceptually separable from its utilitarian aspect. Design patents bring up a similar issue, set of issues and VARA, the Visual Artists' Rights Act, which prevents the intentional destruction of works of art, works of visual art, of recognized stature. Now I have two final examples, and I'd like to linger on them a bit, uh, because I think they show something very important, which is the specificity, both the philosophical specificity and the contextual specificity that characterizes aesthetic judgment in law. The substantive aesthetic de determinations made within the law often parallel, I think, in remarkable detail the kinds of things that we've been talking about here at this conference, the kinds of conceptual analysis and arguments about value made within philosophical aesthetics. Importantly, though, law's aesthetic judgments almost always occur within a highly specific regulatory context. Law asks philosophy's questions in light of a particular governmental aim, and that matters. For while we might shudder at the thought, at, shudder at the question, should the government get to define what is art? We might have a rather different reaction to the question of whether imported sculpture should be given a tariff exemption not available to other manufactured objects of metal. So let me say a word about tariff law. Since 1913, paintings, drawings, sculptures, etchings, engravings, and woodcuts have been importable to the US duty free. Perhaps surprisingly, this largely came about due to advocacy from American artists. Now I say surprisingly because, of course, we can't imagine, say, American car makers advocating for duty-free imports of German or Japanese cars. What the artists claimed, though, was that artworks aren't like cars. When it comes to art, supply creates demand. It thrives on an aesthetically educated public. Moreover, artworks aren't fungible. As the American Free Art League told Congress, art is, quote, non-competitive because a work of art is a work of genius and not the product of a machine. American jobs apparently wouldn't suffer by importing foreign artworks because as the unique product of foreign geniuses, these works couldn't be made here anyway. The whole notion of genius precluded the kind of imitation or rule following that would make domestic competition possible. Now, whatever we might think of this account of art making, it's certainly one which speaks well to the goals of tariff law, which is to protect and develop domestic industry. But here's the point. This account of art, which justifies the tariff exemption for art, also serves to define and limit what tariff law will count as art. Thus, we see tariff law's limitations on the number of multiples allowed in duty-free. It defines a uh, work of art as having no more than 12 casts or reproductions. And since disinterested pleasure is to art's reception, what genius is to art's making, we get tariff law's long-standing exclusion of objects, quote, capable of any functional use. In short, tariff law, with its distinction between art and craft, beauty and utility,
endorses a broadly Kantian notion of art, it subsidizes the kind of art that fits those notions, and notably it does so because that's the approach that best serves Teraflaw's own protectionist ends. One last example. In the 1990s, Congress waded into one of the more contentious debates in the philosophy of art, the question of whether a work's moral value contributes to its artistic worth. Now broadly, you could argue that evaluating art morally is to make a category mistake, that artworks can be evaluated morally, uh, but their mor morality is irrelevant to their artistic value. You could say that the previous claim is true of some genres, but not others. You could say that a work's morality systematically counts in favor of its artistic merit. Or you could be an immoralist and argue that certain artworks are more artistically valuable because of, not in spite of, their immorality. Perhaps because it serves to deepen our understanding or our imaginative capacity. Now, after the Maplethorpe controversy, uh, about grants awarded by the National Endowment for the Arts, Congress amended federal law to say that, quote, artistic excellence and artistic merit are the criteria by which grant applications are judged, taking into consideration general standards of decency and respect for the diverse beliefs and values of the American public. Now, interestingly, nine out of the 13 judges who heard a constitutional challenge to that language, Finley v. NEA, described morality and decency as elements of what Congress regards as artistic excellence, not factors to be taken into account in addition to artistic excellence. They were specific in this to particular art forms or genres. Several judges believed that moral considerations could not apply to pure music. But this is to say then that the courts read Congress to have enshrined in the US code what philosophers call moderate moralism, the belief that for some genres of art, but not others, a work's moral value systematically counts in favor of its artistic value. This is what I mean by the philosophical specificity of so many of Law's aesthetic judgments. A question, does contextual specificity, here the distinctive aims of governmental arts funding, make a position like moderate moralism more or less attractive than it might be when considered acontextually? So, I hope that this descriptive account that I've been giving has somewhat primed you for the normative argument uh, that I'll conclude by turning to. Justice Holmes' claim, you'll recall, was that judges should avoid making aesthetic judgments. We could call this the aesthetic neutrality or aesthetic non-discrimination principle. Since Holmes spoke of judges trained only to the law, it's often said that aesthetic neutrality is justified on institutional competency grounds. This is the first rationale usually offered, that judges just aren't connoisseurs or literary critics. The problem here is that judges generally aren't economists or scientists or technocrats or historians either, but they're constantly being asked to make judgments in these fields. Generalist judges generally deal with their incompetence by hearing from experts. So there's no reason, it would seem, that that couldn't be done in regard to aesthetics. Unless, of course, aesthetics is an area in which there just are no experts. And that's the second rationale offered for Holmes's admonition. The idea that there's just no disputing about taste. Or as Judge Learned Hand once put it, quote, we recognize that in aesthetics there are no standards. Now, in the very next sentence of his opinion, Judge Hand went on to ask whether the patented design under review had at least rudimentary aesthetic appeal. So much for no standards. I wonder how many people really believe uh, their claims of aesthetic relativism. Were they true, judges wouldn't be the only ones who should shy away from aesthetic judgments. So should librarians, curators, people making tenure decisions in the humanities. The notion that in aesthetics there are no standards is in tension not just with practice, but also with the past 300 years or so of philosophy, as Anne was telling us earlier this morning. But that's not really uh, the question here. The more relevant belief, the more relevant point, is that the belief in aesthetic relativism is itself an aesthetic judgment, as I've been defining them. It's not a retreat from aesthetic judgment. Consider this from a Supreme Court opinion that was about, of all things, the Playboy Channel and cable scrambling. Justice Kennedy wrote, when a student first encounters our free speech jurisprudence, he or she might think it's influenced by the philosophy that in arts and literature, objective standards of style, taste, decorum, beauty, and aesthetics are deemed by the Constitution to be inappropriate, indeed unattainable. 
Quite the opposite is true. The Constitution no more enforces a relativistic philosophy than it does any other point of view. The Constitution exists precisely so that opinions and judgments, including aesthetic and moral judgments about art, can be formed, tested, and expressed. What the Constitution says is that these judgments are for the individual to make, not for the government to decree. His argument is that the First Amendment prohibits the government from imposing orthodoxies when it comes to aesthetic theory, even if that orthodoxy is relativism. This then is the third, and to me, the only viable rationale for aesthetic neutrality, the First Amendment rationale. But notice that light, unlike the institutional competency and the aesthetic relativism rationales, which are categorical, which would apply across the board throughout the law, the First Amendment rationale only applies to the extent that the First Amendment itself applies. First Amendment applies in full force when the government is out seeking to shut down private expression. But it applies somewhere between much less to not at all when it's the government itself that's engaged in expression or when the government is subsidizing expression. This is to say, finally, that the array of examples I provided earlier could be put on a spectrum for more to less worrisome. The most worrisome examples are those that involve restrictions on private expression. Obscenity and blight determinations are like this. For if the law's aesthetic judgment doesn't go your way in those areas, your book gets burned or your house gets torn down. But on the other end of the spectrum are the aesthetic choices that go into the government's own speech, the more than $10 billion spent in recent years on federal courthouse construction, federal courthouse art, provide a good example of this. But more common and only slightly more fraught are government subsidized forms of expression, direct art funding for sure, but also tax and tariff exemptions, which are of course also subsidies, and perhaps even copyright, which is a limited government-granted monopoly meant to encourage and subsidize expression. The First Amendment restrains government less in situations like these. And that's to say that in these areas of law, aesthetic judgment should not only be allowed, it should be the subject of vibrant public debate. The law and we would no longer have to stumble along in that case, pretending that aesthetic judgment is just not something the law can do. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to open it up for any questions. Any, even from the panel members. One one of the things I was sort of interested in um, a theme picked up from Stefano's and from, from Brian's is this whole notion of making judgments without aesthetics. Is that possible? Is it possible to actually um, not? be able to make aesthetic judgments yeah, in, in terms of the law or in terms of graffiti not having any can one actually switch off our, our own aesthetic judgment uh, no No, no. I mean, that's very, that's very much to my, that my point, that mm. this is constantly happening uh, and seems to be, in most cases, uh, largely unavoidable, which uh, what I'm trying to do is open up space where we can recognize that as being okay. That certainly leaves the places, and vandalism is much like my blight determination yeah. that I'm talking about, where if, if it's going to hinge on uh, the aesthetic value of the piece, then just as Stefano said, uh, this is going to be, I think, an illicit aesthetic mm -hmm. judgment because that's the shutting down of certain kinds of expression but not others, mm -hmm. certain kinds of private expression but, uh, but not others. So I think we're very much in agreement there about what the net result has to be in that kind of case. Yeah. No, well, go I, I, was, I think that it's only dangerous when an aesthetic judgment comes to inform um, a piece of work when there's an unequal treatment to a diversity of works or diversity mm -hmm. of, of uh, forms of blight or appearances of blight or, or, or uh, pieces of vandalism. I don't want to see the dualism, the hierarchy, the binary. So I want to see things treated more equally regardless of whether or not aesthetic judgment is being used. And as, I, I made, uh, as the point I made in my comments, I see the law as being more neutral in that way. It doesn't mean they're not 
they don't have an aesthetic or, or policymakers don't mm -hmm. have an aesthetic is that it's not creating, a, a, it's not differentiating between different types of aesthetic expressions. I wanted to add a couple of things to that. Uh, I generally agree with, with uh, my two esteemed panelists, but I think one distinction or one caution I would raise is that, um, you know, in the seminal Kerry UV Prince case of a few years back, uh, what I found the most disturbing about that court case was that appropriation case, was that um, one of the three federal judges on the Second Circuit made two very interesting comments. One hand said, you know, what, it was, he was questioning Kerry's attorney at, at oral arguments and asking him, you know, but isn't it true that Richard Prince's audience goes to the Met, meaning the Metropolitan Museum, and Kerry Hughes goes to Yankees games? Mm -hmm. And isn't it true that uh, Richard Prince's audience lives in Manhattan and Carrie Hughes lives in Brooklyn? Right. Uh, obviously, he wasn't aware of Williamsburg, but uh, <laughs> that aside, uh, you know, you start to see the problems in, in allowing those with power, like judges, to make very erroneous distinctions, number one, based on assumptions, one. Two, they were very market-based, who the collectors were for Prince and who the collectors were for Carrie. Mm. Uh, along with that, and there are, I think, quite a few art historians in the room, the ignorance of the federal judges as to the relationship between photography as a fine art or as a form of contemporary art and expression, where they very clearly made a hierarchical distinction between painting, uh, if even Prince's work to be called paintings, and carriers, which were just photographs. Right. And, and I think that also is something that, that I would be cautious, and I think I agree, you, you know, the law does allow for, for evidentiary procedures or, or, or to have expert witnesses, but that also presumes that, in this case, the plaintiff like Carrie or even Donald Graham in the more recent Instagram case, that they're going to have the financial means to hire the types of witnesses or expert witnesses that are necessary. And that's even presuming that the expert witnesses I would want from the October group, for example, would be even willing mm -hmm. to do it. Right, and I think that also raises the question of who's an expert witness, yeah. as I think you were mentioning, under, under aesthetics. That was, that was amazing, um, all three of them. And I'm, you know, I'm coming at it as a non-law person, but I just wanted to say vis-a-vis -vis the, the last paper that um, just something that concerned me and maybe I misunderstood is that saying aesthetic judgments are relative or contingent is not saying that we can't, don't, or shouldn't make them. So I would just want to make a distinction that, for me, the problem is the lack of awareness of the contingency of the judgment, which actually goes to exactly what you're saying about class, you know, and how these things inevitably are extremely biased and come down ter in terms of class and exclude certain groups of people and hierarchize and so on. So, of course, we're always going to make sense of the world by making those kinds of judgments, but the, I think the contingency is really important, actually. Um, the relativism of judgments is really important. There is no absolute pre-existing uh, global hierarchy of good versus bad art or good versus bad intellectual production. Mm -hmm. So contingency there could mean one of a few things, right? It could, it could mean bias, as you said. Uh, it could mean that judgments of taste are relative to some kind of uh, context. Um, so you know, are, are always indexed against either, you know, a temporal context or a genre context or a, a context that's about your aim in doing the judging. So things would be yeah. ranked. Those are, those are quite different claims. And the second of those, or it could just be relativism in the sense that it's often used in this debate, meaning there are no standards. So that would be a third kind of thing that people mean when right. they say uh, relativism. The, the last one is... Uh, clearly a substantive aesthetic position. And so that's what I'm saying can't right. be seen as uh, a retreat from substantive aesthetic But what positions. about the claim that there are no pre-existing inherent standards? 
There are no pre-existing. I, I think most people who are questioning mm -hmm. those standards are not claiming that people don't distinguish value. They're claiming mm -hmm. that there is no a priori standard. There's a uh, difference there. Right. Well, so then that's a fourth position, because right? because <laughs> Kant agrees with that. There are no a priori standards by which you can judge what's good art. That's the whole point of judgments of taste. There are no rules to follow. There are no standards of that sort. So you know, even Kant is with you there. So on that definition, Kant's a relativist. But I take it that you're using relativism as a objection to the Kantian notion of taste. I mean, that's how you were speaking earlier today, at least. So, you know, the, no, I, I wasn't actually saying that about Kant. I was saying that about modernist readings of Kant. Kant is also, actually quite clear that, you know, we're acting as if our judgments are based on something a priori, knowing that they're not. Uh, we're acting as if they're, these are judgments about the objects, when of course what they are is judgments of, uh, of you know, the, the play of the faculties. So depending on which of those things you're after there, with, I, I, I would have completely different uh, responses because insofar as relativism is indexed to some kind of context then it's exactly what I'm then in some ways judgment in law is very helpful for that because it's always making it in such a rich contextual mm -hmm. uh, framework um, if it means that there are no standards then uh, it's a very different thing if it means that we're often biased in our judgments which I really think is a, a, a third and distinct claim uh, then that's a real worry and one that comes up in a big way in the in the Cario case uh, But it's of course not a worry that's distinct to aesthetic judgment in law uh, These kinds of biases Unfortunately, you know pervade the law and so we would be needing to guard against them in the same way in aesthetics as we do in Every other case that comes before a judge or or, or jury One more at the back Just in the back there we go Um, I want to reiterate, thank you so much for the fascinating um, discussions, especially coming at it as an art historian who knows this material. Somewhat, obviously, I, I know Buclos' arguments and I've, I'm familiar with all of this stuff and I, I'm a big fan of um, the Aesthetics of Administration essay. Um, so I, I guess maybe it's for all of you. Um, but I'm going to start by mentioning something that Sergio talked about, which was the um, first your statement that artists kind of come, come into their practice of being this belief in being, I think, outside the law or having this kind of assumption of not needing to abide by the law. And then you said, um, and I can't remember, you might, need to, you might need to reiterate this for me, something about artists have to be willing to be responsible or something? Was this right? Uh, to to uh, Take responsibility? Well, to, to deal with the repercussions. Deal concept. with the repercussions. If you're being an outlaw. Right. So, yeah. And um, and then and then you, you after um, some time, you talked about Matta Clark, and you talked about his port work. Um, as an aside, um, Douglas Crimp is actually writing in his memoirs, he has an essay about how at that particular site, um, there were, at that time, that Matta Clark had done that, it was also a place where uh, gay men were meeting up, mm -hmm. and it was, and in a sense, then aestheticized, right? I mean, sure. it had had its own aesthetic, um, and that Matta Clark's intervention there was not the first, but one uh, kind of that followed up on other interventions that are not, cannot be recognized in the same way, kind of like in the graffiti sort of mm -hmm. argument, right? Um, I don't have that hierarchical Vantage. So, in a way, so then you and then you said that Matta Clark's action was like the colonizer, and and that am I wrong? I yeah, that he takes the colonizer's rule. Yeah, which is, which is I've always thought of that work. I mean, I've always thought of Matta Clark as complicating ur the urban fabric, making us think about our relationship to urban space and you know degradation of land and blah blah blah. Um, and, I, and, I, and I do think it does that. It's kind of like an assertion of squatters' rights, right? So you could say colonizer or you could say squatters' rights. And there, you know, there's a kind of vagueness in those two potentially. Um, though the difference is that the colonizer is obviously um, asserting a certain degree of power and what the colonizer does is, legalize, is legalized by the greater apparatus, whereas the squatter is only precariously given that right, 
Um, okay, so what does this have to say? Um, I guess I'm, I'm interested then in what you're saying insofar as it totally, is, is the intention then to kind of disrupt the idea, first of all, that the artist has this capacity to democratically present some kind of radical critique because they need the power structure in order to present that critique. Mm. Um, and then, uh, and, and, and obviously are very much supported by it, or to use the words that Brian said, that they're subsidized, right? <laughs> I thought a great word, like you're subsidized, right? Because you're, you're privileged position by claiming something's art, or even the graffiti, by claiming it's art, it, then it like suddenly has this go where everything else in society, every, everyday aesthetics, just don't. Um, so I don't know what my question is exactly, but then, I, I, at least I want to put that out there, but then I want to say one more thing, which is that there is an assumption, of course, within the legal framework, that from which the three of you are seeming to come from, maybe not Stefano as much, but, but legal assumptions of questions of equality. Am I, am, I, am, I, am I wrong about that? But there's like a kind of a drive toward equality. And, and it's that thing that's up against judgment as a matter of determining distinctions and hierarchies. And so, and I think what, I think that the, the kind of dissonance, if I will, put between those two frameworks is actually really, um, it, it can kind of, it can really be disruptive to the whole aesthetic enterprise in that regard. Yeah. All right, so, so apologies if I seem to randle, ramble, but maybe you have some thoughts. No, that, that's uh, great. Um, maybe as a, as a preface to answering or uh, attempting to answer your question or address your thoughts, uh, the person up here uh, to my left made a very interesting comment when she said uh, that she comes at this from a non-legal perspective. And I always appreciate when arts people say that because you'll see that in the legal profession, you're excluded. You don't hear that. Lawyers, law professors, judges would never say, I don't know nothing about art. <laughs> right. they, they always um, propose that their legal training allows them the ability <laughs> to talk about. And they'll always cite the, the trifecta, Duchamp, Rauschenberg and Warhol. Like, that's the only notion of art history that exists in the law. Um, and I'm, I know this is being recorded, this is why I'm saying that. <laughs> uh, you signed the form. If, so. <laughs> yeah, but that's the only reason I signed it. That's the only reason I signed it. I even waived my royalties, if you notice. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, you ask a very, I, I did know that about, about uh, the use of, of the peer before Mara Clark, but See, my, my project here is because it is bracketed within the term of art, right? And what is the role of the artist now? I didn't say that because I wanted to keep my paper to 12, 15 minutes. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, I, I start with this observation because I think that artists, you know, I went to law school as an art project. And it wasn't until I was in law school that I realized how ignorant I was that everything that I had been taught at CalArts in the Whitney program um, was kind of like, um, uh, it was a dream, and I was being forced to put it to its tangible materiality. What, what these fictions actually do, right? How the rubber hits the ground. And, and so I, I see Mata Clark as going in that direction, in, in highlighting, I use the term colonizer very, very specifically and intentionally because you know, I, I, I remember reading Fanon, Franz Fanon, when he said the, 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 the boomerang theory, or the three stages of violence, the colonizer on the colonized, colonized on colonized, and then the third step is the colonized on, back onto the colonizer. And I, when I read Property Outlaws through Fanon, that's when I, it hit me, right, that, that what some good artists, I think, like Mata Clark, are doing is saying, if law is a fiction, then I'm going to use the same tools that were used upon us, quote unquote, if, we, if I can say us, but to now contest those same property doctrines, right? Or what does it mean to, to say better use, public use, public purpose, in eminent domain language, for example? Okay, so, so that was, to me is very specific, whereas in Young's, to me, that those projects to me don't do anything but actually make um, 
they glamorize law to the extent that if, if stu art students learn those projects and see those as viable art projects to interrogate law, they're in fact just furthering the problem rather than analyzing it. So I want to thank you for a really interesting panel um, and um, maybe take you in a direction that you're not fully comfortable with, I hope. Um, and, and so the, the notion of law that you've discussed today, a lot of it, all three of you, really circles around property law um, and, and American property law in particular. Um, and American property law has, broadly speaking, um, a contractarian genesis um, and is founded on the idea that property rights in a certain sense precede the existence of the state and it is the role of the state to secure those property rights and only in cases where there can be demonstrated harm to the social body can those property rights be violated or when there can be dem demonstrable goods for the social body, can those property rights be violated? Right? So the, the first case would be um, something like pornography law um, uh, or weapons law, and the second case would be uh, eminent domain law. And I'm wondering if we conceived of property in a somewhat different way, what effect that would have, right? And so I'll, I'll just take one example out of um, the, 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 the canon, the, the straightforward canon of political philosophy, which is um, Rousseau. And, and Rousseau, unlike Locke, right, Locke, Locke conceives of property rights as a kind of natural right, that it is in the role of the state to secure. Um, for Rousseau, property rights are really a kind of positive right. Um, and, and he makes this argument that, that says that it could only be individual property if it had first been communal property, right? And, and so you can kind of think about that in terms of real estate, right? That you can, you're, you're, pro, you're if, assuming you, you own some sort of property for which you have a deed or a title, whether that's a car or, um, or a house or an apartment or whatever, right? That it's only because the ter territory as a whole of the United States that is secured by the United States that then that property could be granted to you, right? And so that the property is sort of first communal and then only secondarily individual. And so you get a notion in which um, you might be able to articulate some kind, a, a richer notion of community rights, community standards, um, and the like. And, and, and the questions about um, uh, cr creator rights versus community rights might start to look somewhat different if we thought of law in a different sort of way. All right. So um, it, it's a, a fairly open-ended question to see whether, whether anybody has, any, any of the three of you have um, thoughts about the, the, maybe the sort of the limitations of American law or what it might be to, to think of law differently in the kind of context that you're discussing here today. Thanks. I mean, I think I think the place where you've seen the the most uh, adv advocacy toward in that direction is uh, is lately in intellectual property law, um, where there's much more discussion of, of uh, or a reinvigorated discussion of the commons um, in a in a way that has echoes of um, your description of, of Rousseau there. Um, so, so that's, that's certainly an area where there's been a great deal of push uh, for a different conception uh, than what we currently have through the Copyright Act uh, as, much, as it gets extended and extended. Um, so otherwise, um, you know, I think you're right that many of my examples could ultimately be traced to, to property in, in these ways. I'm trying to think if there are any in particular that don't. Um, you think that obscenity law does as well? Well, I mean, obscenity law is a, I don't know, I mean, it's at least partially property law, right? Because, because it's, it's, can we suppress 
ownership of this material? Can we suppress the publication of this material? Can we suppress the yeah. making of profit from this material? Yeah. Disseminate dissemination, etc. So that yeah. those are all kind of property questions. To what, what, one small. I, this isn't directly responsive, but one one thing that's interesting to me there is. Uh, the Supreme Court within that context, like in public nudity in general, has uh, rejected the idea that the, the contractarian approach that you're talking about. So it was you know, very strongly urged upon them that when you have consenting adults going into the Paris Adult Theater paying their ticket, and that they should, uh, that there shouldn't be a, a, a problem. There shouldn't be a criminalizable issue there. Uh, and that's been firmly rejected, where morals legislation of that kind of sort uh, is able to trump our normal default, which is, as you say, this kind of uh, contract-based rule of law. Uh, so, such a consent is, you know, joint consent freely given is not enough there to uh, remove that from the law's purview. Uh, again, that's not directly responsive, but it's related to what you're raising. Yeah, and I think that, you know, what's interesting about your question and focusing on obscenity is that that was a 70s case, I believe sure. that was 74, 1974, mm -hmm. uh, Miller v. California, yeah. Yeah. right? And um, I think about these, you know, your question vis-a-vis -vis the technological tools we have now, right, with the internet, right? Um, and, and what does it mean to send and receive, to view, um, to hold, and to own? and it reminds me of, uh, it's a seminal essay that's taught, or at least one reads and when one studies property is the tragedy of the commons, right? And you're probably familiar with that, right? And so it, it, it kind of goes in line with that note of thinking of, okay, it's great, we all start out with a 10 by 10 foot parcel of land, and eventually someone, uh, you know, and one cow, and eventually someone feels like they should put two cows on it and then three, and then four, and then thus the tragedy begins, right? And, and, I, and I think that, I say that because uh, some of my students always raise um, Occupy Wall Street as a moment of, of community coming together, and then what's the first thing that happened was one of those communitarians or communists filed for a trademark registration for Occupy Wall Street, right? <laughs> and, you know, it, it is funny, it is, I think it's hilarious, but I think that it, I go back to the tragedy of the comments, so what is it about intangible property, intellectual property? Um, and increasingly, I think, what's gonna be called aesthetic property rights, uh, which is gonna be like the sixth or the, the next dimension of property ownership, because property is not a thing, as we know. Uh, the, the, the traditional doctrine is, is the bundle of rights theory, like number one. But increasingly, there's a, that, at least in the US, Right, that it's not the physical thing, but it's a bundle of rights between me and you to a thing, a bottle of water. But, um, and now there's like counter proposals to that theory about going back to a thing, to actually going back to a physical thing. And, uh, you know, I'm just starting to think about what, why are we returning back to the materiality, to, to the ontological, I guess, for the philosophers, right? Like, like how do, why, whatever, why do we want to go back to that? And I think it's, we're starting to see that um, if, we, if we think of property as a bundle of sticks or a bundle of rights, anything can become owned. And this is what interests me about Buclo and, and, and eventually conceptual art, is because what we're seeing is a shift from aesthetics, I think, to the market, mm -hmm. where it, it isn't really anymore about uh, taste and, and, and beauty uh, and cognition and experience. It's about market value. There's someone just down here. Hi. Uh, I have kind of two questions. One is for Sergio and uh, this idea of appropriating the law, especially in regards to something that um, you mentioned as well as Stefano mentioned about its relationship to space and what kinds of spaces may deem certain things are or not. And um, this is in direct relationship to and Andrea Fraser's current exhibition at the Whitney. I don't know if you've seen it. I have not personally. I've only read reviews about it. But her recreation of the prison industrial complex there, and um, especially since you were kind of talking about these artistic practices as something that was successful or not, if you have any opinions of that show, um, and if you'd be willing to share them with us. And then the second one is uh, for Stefano. Um, because you, 
argue about taking away the way in which we attach art to graffiti or street, I guess the aesthetics of street, streets maybe? Uh, I don't know how we would kind of reconceptualize this in a lot of ways. But what about um, if you've reconceptualized the way in which we, we refer to the peeper, people who make graffiti? Uh, because we call them graffiti artists or street artists, and so often we attach a tag or a certain aesthetic quality to a particular person. So how would we redefine those people? Would there be multiple different ways to define them based on the kinds of practices they engage with? Would you classify them as like activists or interventionists or I don't know. I was just wondering if you've thought about reconceptualizing the people as well as the actual like property product. So they're not necessarily related, but... Um. Do you want one of them to go first? Whichever. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that people are surprised to hear is that um, despite um, legislation that increases sentences for people convicted of a felony who are understood to have con committed that felony, that act, in, in connection with a gang, and despite all the talk about gangs and the fear of gangs and the obsession with gangs, there's no definition of what a gang is. In the social sciences, there's never been a definition. Social scientists, um, in, in the English-speaking world at least, can't even agree on what an individual gang member is or what he or she looks like or does. Even, even engaging criminal activity isn't universal criteria for what makes a gang member. So one of the only ways to understand people who commit crimes is to understand them as individuals who broke the law, and these individuals have a, have a range of identities that define them. The same holds for graffiti writers. Um, I, I, don't, I don't mean, to, it, it, it's, not, it's not like try, trying to poke a hole in your question. It, it's actually respectful of your question. As how do we redefine graffiti writers or taggers? Or, we, I mean, I don't mean to sound overly naive or optimistic, but we just don't. When you, when you break the law, you get convicted of a crime. In the meantime, I don't think there's a, there's a need to categorize these people who do this thing that is largely uncontrollable. And I'm not saying that makes it good or bad or that it shouldn't be controlled or that it should or should not be criminalized. I'm saying that the category for these individuals should not be reduced to the activity of committing the crime or doing an artwork. So in the graffiti community, graffiti writers refer to themselves as writers. And some of them, for acceptance, refer to themselves as graffiti artists. Um, no graffiti writer I've ever talked to or known of uh, known, uh, refers to themselves as a tagger. But all these, all these terms and categories are to appeal to certain audiences. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I, I, I'll, I'll leave it there because I, what I don't want to say is what I think should happen to graffiti or how people should think about graffiti. But I do think that individuals are too dynamic and interesting to be categorized according to that thing they did in the middle of the night last night. To each other they should and can, but that's, that's a private matter. <laughs> um, so your question was uh, re relating to Andrew Fraser's new installation at the Whitney Museum on the fifth floor, I believe, right? So A, what I'm gonna say is, is based on what I've read about the project. And I haven't actually seen it or experienced it yet. It's an audio piece, my understanding is. Uh, where the fifth, complete fifth floor of the Whitney Museum is empty uh, and the viewer walks in, or listener in this case, and here's an audio of uh, certain parts of Sing Sing prison, am I correct? Uh, of my understanding is of prisoners interacting, whether they're uh, solo or in combination with other prisoners, right? Um, you know, truth be told, I, based on that understanding, I, I think it's a travesty. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Because I, you know, I, I, I obviously I'm familiar with Fraser's work, and I think that if, if the intent is to analyze the relationship between museums and prisons, as investment opportunities, um, then I question. I mean, it's a great analysis to to enact. I, I don't argue that, but I think using uh, prisoners and the lives of prisoners and and, and commodifying and, and and fetishizing that to make that critique is is um, bordering on irresponsible uh, and, uh, you know, maybe even unethical and, and, and really, uh, you know, could, I would pose this question to her, could that analysis have been made in another way, right? Um, and, you know, 
I also think when you ask that question of people who have negotiated the law and continue to do so as a political position, like Adrian Piper, you know, her version, her and Hans Hacke's version of uh, Seth Siegelov's and Robert Projansky's uh, artist rights transfer agreement, uh, roughly from 1971, right, when, when the first uh, agreement for artist rights was enacted, uh, contract, Michael Asher, um, again, you know, the use of the contract as part of the project, and then a little bit more materialistically, someone like Sturdevant, uh, and even Mike Kelly, uh, you know, his project Reconstructed History, I think is phenomenal to look at the role of history, Im uh, images in history books, both at the middle school and high school level, uh, and his inscription and reinscription on them, and, and the annotations that he makes. So, uh, yeah, I, I actually want to write about that project, so this helps me think about it. Thank you. <laughs> One there, and then Don at the back. So. Oh, I, um, thank you all. I'd like to um, ask a question to Stefano, but first I have a comment to Sergio, which is just to thank you for this term, gratuitous fiction, which I thought was really helpful vis-a-vis -vis those Carrie Young um, projects that I have written about critically, but I haven't always had a good language to talk about. And actually, when I saw them again today, it struck me how actually really cynical they are and how, but and, and maybe in a way that's more interesting than we have both given them credit for. So, because I think they actually are about a kind of underscoring of privilege and, and an absurdity, in fact. But I, I'm, but anyway, I think you've really helped me think about them in a, in a new way, and I'm super grateful. And I have a question for, for um, Stefano. That was such a helpful paper, and really, I'm so excited about the work that you're doing And as someone who um, thinks a lot about graffiti and teaches it and tries to have students write about it, and I, I'm really hoping to um, contribute to some of the conversations around it um, and not necessarily in a way that absorbs it unthinkingly into some kind of hierarchization. But I do have a question about how you conceive in your own work about questions of gender. And I'm thinking about Teresa Caldera's really important work on um, Pisha Sao in Sao Paulo and all male tagging crews and how at the same time they are pushing back against criminalization and class stratification. They also are you know, participating in the um, the patriarchal ways that public space is built for some um, some peoples and not others, and uh, and I just was curious how questions of gender play into your research. Um, I, I think uh, many people are surprised when I say, which I think is a reality for most places. But my 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 knowledge of the graffiti community is really deep in Los Angeles, a few other cities around the world, but Los Angeles is the prime location. And that is that graffiti writers are very, very conservative. Graffiti writers are very, very socially conservative, um, often politically conservative, and then just in a kind of a general way conservative in terms of outlook and living life. Um, and part of that conservatism, like it is in most aspects of conservatism, results in a very heteronormative viewpoint and a very sexist viewpoint, whether, whether um, outright demeaning of, of other in terms of any other, in particular gender, but definitely a heteronormative and even machismo masculinity. At the same time though, some of the most well-known, that is prolific and respected graffiti writers in Los Angeles and other cities' histories have been female. And because graffiti writers are, you know, they're producing something that's cryptic and they're hidden and they, graffiti writers, as much as they're accused of being egomaniacs, which they are, also shy away from attention. It, it, it's, a, it's a weird issue there. Graffiti writers are all about putting their name up, but at the same time don't want to be exposed for who they are. So many people don't know that some of the most prolific and innovative graffiti writers in LA history have been females. And being a prolific um, a graffiti writer as a female, or being considered someone who's not a toy, that is someone who's good, it, it, it gains you entrance into this boys club of, graf of, of graffiti writers, because it is predominantly male. And it's at that point, similar to the perpetuation of a colorblind society, it's, oh, well, you're not a girl, you're a bomber, a bomber being a prolific graffiti writer. Your gender falls away as you're given respect 
for innovating new uh, styles of graffiti or innovating new approaches to the spots that a graffiti writer hits. So I don't see that as, as less sexist, but I, I do think that female participation in the graffiti subculture since 1969 in terms of global graffiti, but even before that in terms of Chicano, Chicana graffiti in the streets of Los Angeles is really important in terms of the contribution by females. Um, socially though, it's a different story because there is that, that remaining hostility. And by hostility, I mean the perpetuation, for example, of a colorblind society, I see as racial hostility. I don't see it as an opening up. Oh, mm -hmm. oh sorry, yeah, I was, no, no. I was just gonna add something very quickly to that. Um, it's, it's, it's related, at least in my mind it is, is this, you know, this question of the, the, the outlaw or, or, or the graffiti or street artist, uh, or, or even Mata Clark as being an outlaw. And, um, but especially with, with street artists, I think what's interesting is, is this, I've been watching Breaking Bad again, this is my fourth time. <laughs> and I, one of the things that, I, that fascinates me is how uh, Walter White wants authorship. He wants recognition, right? He, he wants to be known as the author of Crystal Blue, right? And uh, that's something that I, I also want to think about further is why the desire if one wants to break the law or counter the law to then still want some kind of property ownership or authorship as vested through the linguistic, linguistic legal normative known as author. Right? Like, this is my property, I did this, right? And, and I see this a lot when, when I have, uh, uh, some artists who, who do something unlawful and they say, well, don't I have a First Amendment right to do that? <laughs> right? and, and that's like my, my clearest example of wanting to, to subvert, but at the same time, wave the, the constitutional flag. Don. Yeah, I, it's, it's late in the day and I'm, I'm wondering if I, I can make a, a coherent question, but I guess what it's, it seems to me that, um, that we've, we've got the law as, um, I'm, my, so anyway, we have the law which stipulates certain things and, uh, and may impinge or may not impinge upon the First Amendment depending on the burden uh, placed upon it. Um, but I, what's, I guess, got me kind of um, confused is, is the, um, the time spent analyzing, let's, uh, the work uh, with the um, uh, colonizing, let's say, uh, the time spent analyzing that as a kind of legitimate, or sounds like a legitimate artwork, uh, and whether or not it should be penalized. Um, uh, so I, I guess that's where I'm, I'm kind of confused. And, and if we are going to analyze it as an aesthetic object, then uh, it seems like there's another, that's another argument. I would say, you know, why not punish the, com the people who pollute it, corporations who polluted the water by polluting them, you know? So, uh, it, it, so I'm, I'm kind of confused about how the two parts intersect. And I don't know if that's a, a coherent question at the end of the day, but um, I mean, it's, it's all absolutely fascinating, but um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what I should do with, with a, a justification of aesthetic value within the context of, of absolute, um, would, would bring about absolute uh, anarchy if we allowed uh, this thing to go on. And I think you all agree with that, so. Wait, when you say it would bring a, about absolute anarchy if everyone did what Gordon Mata Clark did, trespassed and I mean, but the thing is that law, a, a case sets precedent. So, you know, you could say, well, that's silly. Not everybody's going to do that. But, you know, the next one comes along who does this, and there's now precedent for uh, accepting it. So I, I, I guess it's, it's, the argument isn't quite like what mom used to tell me when, you know, I would want to transgress. But um, uh, so, so, it, uh, one one case has precedent on another, so uh, so I, it's a, it's I don't know. 
I mean, if I'm understanding your thoughts and question correctly, you know, the thing about property outlaws to me and, and stemming from this text that I um, indexed by uh, two legal scholars, Eduardo Peñalver and Sonia Cattell, is that uh, if you look at people like, uh, well, Rosa Parks uh, or uh, Native American contestations of land or sit-in movements, right, that uh, maybe not all contest laws with or without precedent, but they also contest social norms and cultural norms, right? And I think um, maybe to sort of bring a little caffeine into the room, what, I, to, what I'm seeing happen with the Bernieization and Trumpization of this country is exactly what you're talking about. I don't call it anarchy. I think what you're seeing is uh, an expression of speech, an expression of content. Whether one agrees with it or not is up to each individual. Right, but um, I think that that's the way in, in the rubric that I would put in Mata Clark's, all he's really doing is, 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 in my analysis, is questioning what is that better use? You know, is, is a better use, you know, down the street in New London, you know, the seminal case 2006, Kayla versus City of New London, uh, first time the Supreme Court says that a, um, a takings of property uh, is allowed under the Fifth Amendment because it has now a public use, and that public use is that for profit. Right, the establishment of a shopping mall, right, tax revenues, employment, parking, et cetera, right, and is that a better use? And and that's that's my anchoring of, of modern art. We have we have one other uh, very close analog though to what's being described here, which is uh, religious exemptions. Uh, so Hobby Lobby, Little Sisters of the Poor, all the cases that we've recently had, uh, all the laws that are being passed. Uh, being you know, styled as uh, First Amendment protection laws, but for example, this proposed constitutional amendment in Missouri, uh, are all laws that would allow, or direct constitutional claims that would allow an exemption from an otherwise generally applicable law. And there's a number of areas in which similar claims have been made on behalf of artists as well, making the same kinds of claims. One way in which those are disanalogous claims, which is coming very much out of uh, both the other papers, is that the religious exercise doesn't get any extra oomph out of being an illegal religious exercise in, most, in any case that I can think of, whereas that's not very much not the case in many art projects, uh, where a lot of the expressive oomph comes precisely as we're hearing you know, from its illegal status. Otherwise, they're quite close analogs. And, yeah, that's a good point. And remember also that I anchored uh, Mata Clark to intent, right? Because I think the more, uh, I'll be quite frank, I think Richard Prince's last bodies of work are, are very um, uh, infantile. Maybe that's giving them too much credit. And because they're, they're lacking intent. And, and I say that because what, what you end up with is you end up within the courts having to assess his intent. And what's, what's really more perverse is that there are legal scholars, art lawyers, uh, art law professors, and some in the arts community that say, the artist shouldn't have to say what he or she means, what he, what he or she intends. And you think about where the hell do they, what really benefit do they derive from wanting to take that position, right? The art, they, they'd rather have a reasonable observer do the interpretation of, of mm -hmm. what that artwork means. And then when you ask them, well, who's the reasonable observer? Curators, art critics, but not the artist, right? And I, and I think that's when you're looking at, yeah. to me, you get anarchy, where you, where you get uh, audio of prisoners uh, overlooking the Hudson. I just want to add a quick point. Uh, I'm just picking on the term anarchy. Yeah, it, it, yeah. <laughs> I will just point out that when thinking about graffiti, if anarchy is to be understood the way I understand it, that is a non-hierarchical approach to some kind of system, that system is self-policing to some degree, to a large degree, and the anarchy would be, would be an inversion of, of use values for the appearance of the built environment. It wouldn't be a free-for-all chaos, that's different, but there's actually order in anarchy. 
And right now you have a very anti-anarchy, a very hierarchical um, system in which those who, who have training or money or power get to aestheticize all of our lived environments. Um, I think anarchy would make cities far more interesting and not result in chaos. Would result in, a, in actually a, a higher aesthetic order that would be much more stimulating and egalitarian and emancipatory for more people. I think that's a great point to, uh, <laughs> to thank the panel for a great presentation. I'd also like to um, do a call out to you, Eureka and Michael's just ran out the door, but I think the, the phenomenal work that's gone in setting up this symposium. So well done. So the, so the next session is in the old library, which you will need to get card access to. So uh, find a RISD person um, yeah. and go. Uh, we are going to start up. that at 4.30, and uh, it's about 4 or 5 now. Yeah. So, uh,